Hello everyone. This is Alzheimer's 101 for Physicians, and it's a joint project between AMWA and CareBrains. My name is Jody Lyons, and for decades I was senior staff in subspecialty medical societies, and then I became the CEO of an international association that represented nursing homes, long-term care facilities, assisted living, home health care, senior housing, et cetera. And not only was I responsible for representing the needs of the providers in those situations, but I was also working with the U.S. federal government on some of the regulatory issues and oversight issues surrounding the industry. I'm the co-author of a book called Brain Health as You Age, which was published by Roman and Littlefield. And I'm also the author of the upcoming book, which is a fictionalized account of Lewy body dementia called The Sea Glass Epidemic. I'm a former executive committee member of the Alzheimer's Association National Capital Area. So why did I get involved in dementia care? It became a natural outreach for me because of all the medical societies I'd worked with and everything I learned about the different patient bases. And on the one hand, I was helping older adults find the care they needed. And then on the other hand, it turned out that the doctors needed some help with the education and outreach as well. It was the caregivers were on one side, the medical professionals were on another side, and then you had the legal and the financial advisors, and nobody was talking to each other. So since I was on the lecture circuit helping older adults find the care they need, I decided to just expand and help everybody. I now work almost exclusively with dementia patients. They're not all Alzheimer's patients. We've got Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about how people aren't talking to each other and that the patients expect a lot from their doctors. Let's talk about the overview of what this course is. We want you to be able to know what you need to know by the end of this course. Number one, what's normal aging versus dementia? Meaning, when do you worry about it? When do you not? Relevant facts about dementia physicians need to know, particularly women and dementia. Dementia warning signs, the various types of dementia, as I alluded to before, it's not all Alzheimer's all the time. What your patients and caregivers need to know, what your patients expect you to know, what your patients expect of you personally, not just you as a doctor, but you as a human being. How do you manage those expectations? Of course, the good news is you can get paid for it. So we have a section on billing codes for providing dementia-related care and, and how you can get paid for that. And then finally, we give you an introduction to the 10-credit CME course that we offer which is called Improving Dementia Care and Patient Satisfaction. With that said, let's go jump into what is normal aging and what's not. So let's start with what normal aging is. As you get older, you may walk into a room and forget why you did so. You shouldn't necessarily worry about it. It's really common, especially if you're thinking of something else. For example, you go into the kitchen because you know you want to go get a soda out of the refrigerator, but you're also worried about where you put your car keys and that you're running late for work. Again, it's divided attention. You shouldn't really worry about that. That's normal. It's also normal, and I know we've all done this. Let's say you're driving to the grocery store, and as you're driving, your phone rings, and you take the call and it's your spouse who wants to talk about what you're going to have for dinner or whether you're going to go out for dinner, etc. And you chat about your day and the next thing you know, you've sailed past your exit and you've missed it completely. So when you miss those types of things, small forgetting, then 
consider that divided attention and distraction. So you should really pay more attention, not worry about dementia per se, but instead worry more about paying attention to what you're doing. Now let's talk about some fast facts, particularly about women and dementia. In the United States, there are more than 11 million women either living with Alzheimer's or caring for somebody who has it. And these stats come from the 2023 Alzheimer's Association facts and figures. So this is the newest data. Women in their 60s are more than twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's than they are to develop breast cancer when you're looking at the remainder of their lives. So again, think of it this way. In the remainder of their lives, women in their 60s are more than twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than they are to develop breast cancer. I know nobody's surprised by this next one. More than 60% of Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers are women. And more than one third of the people caring for someone with Alzheimer's are family members, particularly daughters. This is the part that even I found surprising. Nearly 19% of women Alzheimer's caregivers had to quit their jobs, either to become a caregiver or because their caregiving duties became too burdensome. What does that mean? It means that either they had to quit their jobs and become a caregiver 100% of the time, or when they were trying to still work and do caregiving, that it became so burdensome that they weren't succeeding at either. 19% of people, that becomes a very expensive economic decision. Let's talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease versus dementia. In general, we use the word dementia as an umbrella term. It's an overall term and it covers a range of specific diseases. The most common one is Alzheimer's. Dementia is not a disease. Dementia is a syndrome and it's an umbrella term. So to be completely honest, when I have a client who said, my mom's been diagnosed with dementia, I say, and did the doctor mention which type? And they say, no, I say, find another doctor. Again, dementia is an umbrella term, not a disease in and of itself. It's recognized by a decline in memory, executive function, language, and other cognitive skills. The big definition is that it affects a person's ability to adequately perform everyday activities. And again, still an umbrella term, not a disease. It's caused by damage to the brain cells. Let's talk a little bit about the warning signs. You may have patients who come in complaining of the following. Memory loss that disrupts daily life. What does that mean? Mom forgets to turn off the stove. Mom forgets to take her medicine. Things like that. Challenges in planning or solving problems. If something goes wrong, for example, the microwave stops working, can they think of looking at the circuit breaker? Or if they see water on the floor, do they know to wipe it up? Or can they plan in advance for something? They need to go to the grocery store and they need to buy the following items. So again, planning in advance or problem solving. One of the big ones is difficulty in completing familiar tasks at home, at work, or at leisure. So somebody who at work all of a sudden can't remember how to log on, we all forget our passwords back, you know, that just happens. But somebody who's at work and forgets the procedure for logging on, or we, we all have the holiday in dinner where you're trying to cook and you have people coming in and out of the kitchen and they're bothering you and you accidentally burn the gravy. That's not the same thing as forgetting to turn the oven on repeatedly or totally messing up things you used to know how to do, forgetting how to do laundry when they've done laundry every day for decades. 
confusion with time or place. Now, you know, as part of cognitive exams, you'll say, you know, where are you? Is this an office? Is this a hospital? What state are we in, et cetera? But if the person seems unsure where they are, is it day? Is it night? Is it hot? Is it cold? Where am I? That kind of confusion is a warning sign. This one is often overlooked. Trouble understanding visual images or spatial relationships. So let's say, for example, you have a placemat on the table and you have a dinner plate and silverware and a napkin and a glass. And the person takes the glass, lifts it to their mouth, goes to drink it. And then when they're going to put it down back on the placemat, they have a hard time discerning the difference between the edge of the placemat and the table itself, and it can wobble, it can spill, et cetera. That disruption in a spatial relationship is an early clue and it's very often missed. The trouble understanding a visual image can be misinterpreting what they're seeing. Uh, seeing a coat rack with a hat and coat on it and thinking it's a person. One of the other common signs is new problems. Remember, new problems with speaking or writing. We've all heard of aphasia. When it first starts, that's when you need to take notice. So if somebody's always mixed up words and is always using malapropisms, that's just who they are. If it's new, then that's a warning sign that it needs to be checked out. Decreased or poor judgment. We hope it doesn't get to the point that the person's already being scammed. But when you look at decreased or poor judgment, it would be things like um, answering the phone call and giving out your social security number and your bank account number or falling for the grandchild scam or things like that. Sometimes it's not as obvious as that. We've known people who donate to a charity legitimately and then the charity sends them a thank you note and in it, it says, and if you wanna make another donation, here's the envelope. So the people fill out another check, send out the envelope, then they get a call from the charity and then they donate yet again. And they can spend thousands of dollars because they don't remember that they already sent the checks. The poor judgment is not recognizing that they shouldn't be doing something. So they shouldn't be giving out personal information over the phone. That if they're on the internet, they shouldn't be clicking on certain links. They shouldn't be wandering around alone in the dark. They shouldn't be leaving their handbags in the top of the shopping cart where you would seat a child. That sort of information. So if you see the judgment decreasing or becoming poor, that is a warning sign. One of the other big issues, and this has been harder to discern because we've just come out of a pandemic, withdrawal from work or social activities. So people really isolating themselves. That can be an issue. It can be a sign of anxiety or depression or cognitive impairment, and it needs to be looked at. They do seem to go hand in hand. We're seeing more and more depression and anxiety mimicking symptoms of cognitive impairment, exacerbating existing symptoms of cognitive impairment, et cetera. So if you find out your patient is self-isolating, you really need to look into it. And another big one is changes in mood and personality. Somebody who was always shy and introverted suddenly becoming gregarious, somebody who was gregarious becoming shy and introverted, anything that seems a significant variation from the norm is something that needs to be looked at. Today, there are more than 6 million people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And very often, people don't acknowledge that there's a problem because they all think that it's, well, mom still remembers me, so she must be fine 
when realistically, in most cases, it's the visual spatial relationships that stop first. It's the not being able to put the glass on the table, reaching your arm out and missing where the cup is, et cetera. The vocabulary and motor function can be even further down the line. This is the really, really tough part. Since people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias suffer from not only memory loss, but other cognitive deficits, they frequently, let me emphasize frequently, 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 lack the insight into the severity of their disease. They are cognitively incapable of understanding how sick they are. And so what happens is you have issues with driving safety. You have issues with um, refusing to take medication, refusing to allow help into the house, refusing to go to residential care, et cetera. It's not just denial. Very often the brain with dementia simply can't recognize that it has dementia. It's part of the disease. So I've been using the word dementia throughout. Right now, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the different types of dementia. For more details, you can look at our CME course on carebrains.com. But I want you to be aware that, first of all, dementia is not the disease. And second of all, it's not all Alzheimer's. So here are some examples. Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, frontotemporal dementia, which sometimes is still called Pick's disease, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, mixed dementias, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And within each of these categories, there are very often subcategories of other diseases like primary progressive aphasia, et cetera. What's the difference between dementia and delirium? You may have a patient presenting with all of the things we've talked to, talked about up until this point. So we've said, here's changes in what they've done. Here are symptoms they've had, et cetera. Dementia is irreversible. Delirium, if it's caught early, can be reversible. It used to be called reversible dementia. Some people called it pseudo-dementia. But the reality is it is dementia-type symptoms that have a sudden onset. So it may include things like confusion, disorientation, fluctuation in attention span or concentration. They just seem out of it or significant mood changes, or hallucinations or delusions, all sorts of things. And you may be thinking Alzheimer's or another dementia. Here's the real trigger, altered mental status, and it's a quickly arising medical situation. So an example would be mom was fine until last Wednesday and all of a sudden she tried to eat the diaper instead of putting it on. Or dad was fine. He's always been happy go lucky. And starting last Tuesday, he started getting violent and hitting people. You need to think of the time frame in which the symptoms are arising. Again, if it's caught quickly enough, very often it's treatable and you can find the cause of the delirium. On the other hand, if it's left untreated, it can actually become life threatening. Let's talk about some of the causes of delirium. And I'm sure the first thing all of you have heard of in your brain just now as I was saying this is UTI. Urinary tract infection is very, very common. But there are other very common reasons for delirium. Thyroid problem, alcohol withdrawal, not just the misuse of alcohol, but actually withdrawing from the alcohol. Medications. So there's certain categories of medication that are known to cause delirium. Sometimes the medicines that are being prescribed for one disease actually can make 
cognitive issues come to light. Low sodium, vitamin deficiencies, infections, again, UTI or cellulitis or things like that. And in some cases, even the change in living environment, moving somebody from a place where they have their habits to something entirely different. In each of these cases, the symptoms mimic dementia, but the difference is the time frame in which it happened. In real life, dementia does affect your patients. So we're back to the dementia, not the delirium. This is a longer term problem. What's happening? You probably all have heard the term independent activity of daily living, an IADL. That's things like managing medications, finances, and we do not mean balancing a checkbook. Studies show that nobody does that anymore, but the ability to pay bills when they come in, the ability to handle money, um, things like that. Transportation, not only driving, but could you arrange for a rideshare service or call a taxi or figure out that you need to get somewhere between point A and B, even if it means asking a family member. Food preparation. Can you get groceries, even if they're delivered? Can you cause them to be delivered to your house? Can you go out and get them yourself? Can you do something with them and feed yourself? Not the actual activity of putting the food in your mouth, but can you make a sandwich? and housekeeping, not Miss Manners housekeeping, but can you keep your house in a reasonable state of disarray, normal disarray, not unusual, not a hoarding situation, not filthy, not with vermin, et cetera. Somebody who has dementia usually has problems with the IADLs. And that's even in the earlier phases. When you get further on in the disease, then people have trouble with the activities of daily living, which are the more basic activities. So think of it this way. The IADLs support the ADLs. The IADL would be, can you get your food and prepare your food? The ADL is, can you actually put the food in your mouth and eat? The basic skills are bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, and eating. That means, can you cleanse yourself in a shower or a bathtub and wash all of the affected areas that need to be? And cognitively, do you know how to do it? And physically, are you able to do it? Or do you need assistance? The getting dressed. Uh, can you put on all articles of clothing yourself or do you need help? Toileting. Can you either change your own depends or get to a toilet yourself? Can you eat? Can you feed yourself? Can you actually take food off of a plate and put it in your mouth? And transferring is one of the big ones. Can you get up from your bed? Can you get from your bed to a chair? Can you get from a chair into the kitchen? Can you get on and off of the toilet? The ADLs have different levels of being affected. Do you need a prompting? Does somebody need to tell you to do this? Do you need standby assistance? Should somebody be standing by to make sure you don't fall in the shower? Or even hands-on assistance, do you need help being showered in the shower? Or do you need help changing or dressing or all of these things? And then there's total care where you can't do it at all yourself. The important thing to take away from here is there are real life implications of what happens when somebody has dementia. And you, before you even know the person has dementia, are going to hear about these sorts of things. Mom fell in the shower the other day. Mom got stuck on the toilet. It happens, and when that happens, you need to think about cognitive issues, not just the physical. When your patients are coming to you, they want to know some basic things. What does this mean? How do I fix it? How do you cure it? How am I going to afford this? And it all boils down to what is the this they're talking about? 
They don't know. They're scared. They don't know what the word this is in any of the above sentences. They're just looking at make it go away. Let's go into some more detail about that. The following things are what your patients and their caregivers need to know. I am emphasizing the need to know because they don't always want to know, nor do they even know they need to know these things. The first thing is, how do you take over the affected tasks or have someone else do it? This is where you're going to end up having many philosophical discussions with your patients. They are divided into three camps. Number one is, mom can do it herself and it's good for me to make her do it herself because she needs to do it herself. Doesn't work in dementia, but some people just think that way. They believe in the use it or lose it um, syndrome, if you will, but you can't use it or lose it if the brain is dying. So that one's just out. You just have to correct that. The other person says, I'm going to do everything for my mom and I'm going to quit my job. And I am the only person on this entire planet who can take care of mom the way she needs to be taken care of. So I'm going to do it all. Nobody else can do it. There will be no other help. It's me, 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 and only me. Then we get the caregiver burnout. And the third group of people are, no way am I changing dad's, you know, depends, and I'm not showering them, and tell me how to get somebody else to do it. Also within that is the family dynamics, which we'll talk about later, but what they need to know is what needs to be done and who's going to do it. How do you take over the affected tasks without infantilizing the patient? Um, then there's the management of medications, finances, transportation, food preparation, housekeeping. Let's talk about the managing medications first. So you've seen the pill boxes and you've seen that you can sometimes even order the pills and they're all like shrink wrapped or bubble wrapped, etc. A, who does the ordering? B, who's actually putting them in the pill boxes, or C, who's actually making sure that the patient is getting them from the pill boxes or the pill packs into their mouths and swallowing. Because just because somebody took it out of the pill pack doesn't mean they took the medicine. So the managing medications, uh, keeping an accurate medication list, making sure that the doctors know what the accurate medication list is, and by the way, when I'm saying medication, I also mean anything the person's taken over the counter. We all know the people who walk down the aisle in the drug store or the big box store or the nutrition store, and they go down and they take one from everything and they start swallowing all of them and they do interact with some medications. How do they take over the finances? Do they become a... a conservator? Do they become a power of attorney? Do they leave some money for mom and dad to take care of themselves, mad money? They need to know how to do all of these things, how to arrange for transportation, what to do about meals and food preparation and housekeeping. They don't know that they need to know those things. They may pick up one thing, but they don't pick all of it together and say, here are all the things we need to do. And that's just the IADLs. Then when you get down to the ADLs about bathing, dressing, toileting, and all the rest, they're not even thinking about that. How do I get mom to the toilet? And they'll say things like, I put grab bars on the toilet. Well, that's great if your mom remembers how to get to the toilet and how to use it. We've heard stories, and they are very, very common, about Mom walking into the kitchen, squatting over the garbage can and using that as a toilet. Dad peeing in the plants. It happens. Their brains are broken. Their brains are dying. So 
your family caregivers and the patients themselves need to know to watch out for these things. The biggest, biggest, biggest thing they need to know is how to find the appropriate care and how to pay for it. They never know how to do that, even if they think they can. You may notice that this slide looks particularly and almost identically similar to the one before it. The difference is what do your patients expect you to know? They want you to know all the answers to everything we just discussed. They may not expect you to know how to pay for care, but they're gonna to complain to you and say, how am I supposed to afford this? The only thing you can do at that point is do a referral to somebody else who knows all of the different types of care, how to pay for it. And you can make suggestions about the managing medications or you need to bring in help, things like that. It is very, very, very valuable to have a doctor say, you need to bring in help. You cannot do this all yourself. This is the other thing, and this is really the heartbreaking part of it. So, we know your patients just want you to fix it. Make it go away. Bring mom back the way she was. We know that nobody can do that. So then we move to the next level, which is the patients come in and they may, the family caregiver may talk to you in advance. They may email you. They may hand you a handwritten note. They may try to catch you in the hallway or in the bathroom or anything else to get a few seconds of your time away from the patient. And what are they asking? They want you to make the patient stop doing the things that bother the caregiver. We, we want the doctor to make dad stop driving. Now, sometimes you can. We have found it to be very effective that um, sometimes the doctors will actually write an order on a prescription pad that says, remember, you cannot drive, and we put it on the refrigerator. So for a while, that will work. Stop repeating things. You can't make that stop. That's the disease. Stop moving stuff around the house. We affectionately call this the poltergeist syndrome which is that a lot of people with dementia, uh, particularly those with Alzheimer's, shuffle. So they will pick up a cup of soda or a can or a shoe and they'll move it everywhere. So you might have the shoes start out in the bedroom, end up on the sofa, end up in a closet, and then end up in the refrigerator. And it becomes kind of a game of hide and seek, which is where did the poltergeist move my shoe now? So the patients are going to come and say, make mom stop moving stuff around my house. I'm tired of finding shoes in the refrigerator. Stop being mean. We discussed changes in personality and outlook. They want you to adjust that. How do you make your patients stop fighting the caregiver when the caregiver is just trying to help. And one of the others is, and this comes up a lot, is the family caregivers want their loved one to just eat healthy food. And the complaint has multiple iterations. So one is, only I only want dad to eat healthy food, make him do that. My dad only wants to eat sweets, and make them stop doing that. And my dad's eating too much, not enough, or not eating at all. There's a lot of angst around food intake, etc. We all know that as people get older, their taste buds change. And as the brain is slowly dying, their taste buds change. And people with Alzheimer's in particular enjoy sweet foods better. So it may be that somebody is making a beautiful breakfast of bacon and eggs and pancakes and coffee, and the family member is taking the entire bottle of syrup, pouring it over one pancake, making a soggy mess. That's what they're eating, and they won't touch an egg. Or that the person found the 
box of cookies in the cabinet and ate the entire package of Oreos. And then on the other hand, they say mom's not eating enough or dad's not eating enough or dad stopped eating or in later stages of the disease, as the body is transitioning and shutting down, they don't eat at all. And we've had family members who just are, are totally stressed about that, that the natural dying process needs to be stopped and they will do whatever they can to get food into the patient. The bottom line is they're all looking at you to make all these things stop. You have some tools in your toolbox. Some of it is medication management and some of it is just counseling the patient and the family members about what's normal and what's natural and what to expect. As we're talking about expectations, one of the hardest things is that patients expect you to know how to know when it's nearing the end and to tell them about it. They want to know from you that mom is towards the end. I'm not talking about all the staging. You know, most of us just use mild, moderate, advanced for staging. Very often the caregivers get hung up on, is it stage 5A or 5B? But what they're really asking is, how much time do I have left and how do we know when we're getting there? They wanna know what to do in an emergency. Do you call 911? Should they be at on hospice? Um, what do we just not call an emergency? You know the disorientation that happens putting somebody in an ambulance, then sending them to the hospital, then doing something to them. You know about hospital acquired delirium. The family caregivers don't, and you need to tell them that because they're saying to you, well, what do I do in an emergency? And most of you have on your voicemail after hours, if this is an emergency, hang up and call 911. Well, does that change at the end of life? And what do you do about it? Your patients and their caregivers need to be very clear about when do you call 911, when do you call hospice, when is the end near, when do you stop resuscitating somebody, does it change? And please be honest about what you recommend. I've had emergency room physicians call me and say, please make it stop because the family members are saying, do everything, do everything, do everything. And they're saying, you know, we've done CPR on this frail woman with advanced dementia. We've already cracked all her ribs. There's nothing to resuscitate and the family wants us to keep doing it again and again. Be honest about it. Let's talk about now you as a person not just you as a doctor. The caregivers are trying to connect with you on a personal level as well. What do they expect? They expect you to be psychic. You are supposed to know everything said and unsaid, and you're supposed to know the right answer. And by right, I mean, they decided the answer they're looking for. And I know you've all seen them making the frantic gestures behind the patient's back as the patient is giving you the incorrect family history or the poor timing of what happened or not acknowledging that they're not taking their medicines or things like that. But more than that, they expect that you as a person, not your staff, not your answering service, you, their doctor with whom they have a relationship, is going to be available 24-7, 365 by every communication method possible. They're going to be able to call you, text you, email you, send a message to the portal, and you're going to respond immediately. Not in 15 minutes, but now. And the worst part of all of this is that they want you to tell them what they want to hear. Not necessarily the truth not necessarily what you know as an expert or as a professional, but what they want to hear. They wanna hear that everything they're doing is right and it is very, very difficult when you're trying to correct or offer additional advice 
and they take it personally and they're looking at you as a person. Now, one of the other relatively unfair pieces of all of this is that while they're expecting you to be 24 seven, they also get very angry if they call your office and they get voicemail or the person answering the phone doesn't understand how frantic the caller is. In the scheme of things, when you're medically triaging, it may not be a big deal, but it is indeed to the caregiver, the biggest deal on the planet. And so you need to be aware of that and you need to make sure that your staff is trained accordingly because otherwise it goes back on you as a person in their minds. You have a lot of competition. So I've said everything about what people expect for you as the doctor to do. You also know, and we've all had these people who march in with the piece of paper with Dr. Google said, and everything has flu-like symptoms. So they're gonna come in with the newest cure that isn't a cure. They're going to come in with advice, if you will, from the competition. Dr. Google being the first, and I don't mean the, you know, Googling stuff from NIH or CDC or an academic medical center. I mean, like they Googled it and it came up and it sounded good. So coconut oil cures Alzheimer's. The well-meaning but uninformed friends. People say things like, don't baby your mother so much, make her do it herself. Not if she can't. Many of the Facebook groups are filled with very bad information. Some of the information is good, but some of the information, it's intended to be supportive, but it supports some incorrect things. People get information from the hairdresser. Hairdresser Studies have shown that many people will trust their hairdresser for medical and financial advice. Not that they have any experience or knowledge in it, it's just a trusted resource. This one is my favorite. It's the next door neighbor's son's girlfriend who works at CVS, so she's a medical professional. Therefore, she knows as much as the doctors do. They listen to advertising. Denial is probably one of the biggest competitors you have, right? You may be saying A, B, C, and you've got scientific reasons for it. You've got medical history and backgrounds and training, and they're denying it because they don't want it to be true. One of your biggest competitors, right up there with Dr. Google, I probably should have put it on the top, is the family dynamics. There's the family caregiver who does hands-on, there's the fly-in child. There's the kid who's never been around and is looking for their inheritance. There's a spouse who says, I'm not doing this or only I can do this. And you're supposed to know all of these dynamics and you're supposed to act accordingly and then go back to what the family members want you to do. They want you to fix it. It's not fair, but it's what they're looking for. There are many different types of care providers. There are a lot of solutions other than having the daughter quit her job and move in with mom and dad, leaving her own family at home. But people don't know about them. I'm going to run through the types of home of um, care providers right now. Again, we go into much more detail on the CareBrains website and on the CME courses and also on the family caregiver courses because it's a very detailed type of description. Uh, number one, home care. That's also considered non-medical care or personal care. Home health care that has actual health component, skilled nursing, PTOT speech, wound care, etc. Assisted living, memory care, acute rehab and subacute rehab, long-term care, SNFs, SNF, skilled nursing facility or nursing home, 
CCRCs, which are now, they used to be called continuing care retirement communities. Many of them now have switched their names to be called a life care community. Active adult communities, also known as the over 55 community and independent living, which actually doesn't mean anything. It could be living in your own home, living in an over 55 community, living in an assisted living, but not paying for the level of care that you need help with bathing and dressing, et cetera. Your clients, your patients, the family caregivers need to know all of these things. They don't necessarily know all of these things. And when they're saying, doctor, fix it, or doctor, what am I supposed to do now? And you say, you need to bring in help. These are the words that they need to know. Managing the patient expectations is a real challenge. We've talked about what they need to know, what they expect you to know, and how they expect you to be able to answer all of it psychically or understanding the frenetic, uh, you know, handling and hand signs and hand signals and cutting the throat and all this stuff behind the patient, right? So you're supposed to know all of these things. The reality is you need to work as a team. The team members should be doctors, hospital systems, discharge planners, family and professional caregivers and patients, and I will tell you, lawyers and financial advisors. You've all got to be part of the same team so that there's one direction to move in and each of you knows the different parts. What happens too often is a doctor gets called and you can't fix it, right? It's something that needs a hospitalization or it's just a disease progression and you need to be able to deal with that. But very often the treating physician and the hospital don't talk to each other. And very often the hospital never even tells you that your patients are there. The discharge planners have two tools in their toolbox, home with PTOT speech at home and rehab either acute or subacute or home with nothing. There are many other options, and very often we use the hospitalization to move the person forward along the care path. So it could be hospitalization with direct admit to the memory care unit, not going through the nursing home first. But everybody needs to be involved, including the patients to the best of their ability. One of the things that's always missing that ends up that the family caregivers and the patients don't have managed expectations and instead of unrealistic expectations is because the delirium and the dementia are ignored on discharge. So it is, okay, we're dealing with the broken leg or that there was a fall, the patient broke their hip. We fixed the hip. We're going to send them home and let the leg heal and the hip heal. And then we'll start PTOT speech in a while. And nobody really considers the special needs of the dementia and delirium that are occurring along with the hip. So that's when the referrals come in to outside care management, private duty in-home care, maybe going to an assisted living or a memory care unit, et cetera. It's not just a hip. It's a hip and a patient with cognitive impairment. And we all know that the anesthesia can make the cognitive impairment worse. One of the other issues that gets overlooked and it causes tremendous angst in the family caregiver, which then rolls downhill to you, is making sure that the patients have access to the food and medicine that they need. So it's great if you wrote a prescription for something. It's not great if they can't get the medication. Or if you say, take this medication with food, and they either have food insecurity, or even if they can afford the food, that they can't actually get the food or prepare the food or remember to eat. 
And finally, a big tool in your toolbox is family caregiver education, letting them know what to expect so that it's not all a surprise. It's scary enough to go through this process without the unexpected surprises, right? There are expected surprises where you can go, yeah, okay, here we are again. And then there's the boogeyman coming out of the closet. The caregiver education really goes a long way to letting them know what they can expect from you, what they can expect from the disease, what they need to know, and what you need to know. There's good news in all of this. You can get paid. You probably are aware of CPT code 99483. This is the one that was updated from 2017, which is the reimbursement for providing care planning services to people with cognitive impairment, including Alzheimer's disease. If you want more details about it, you can go to cms.gov slash cognitive. But 99483, which the, so the title of it is Billing and Coding Cognitive Assessment and Care Plan Service. It was just revised October 1st of this year. Again, 99483, and here are the requirements for the update. It complements your regular local coverage determination. You know how to bill that. The reimbursement for this code is for physicians and other eligible billing practitioners when you do a comprehensive visit, clinical visit, that results in a written care plan. So there are lots more details about what you need to do in that visit. We'll go through it in a second. But this is the big thing. This is for Medicare in general all beneficiaries who are cognitively impaired are eligible to receive services under this code. You can bill this code even if they have not been clinically diagnosed as having a dementing disease. If you as the clinician determine that they are cognitively impaired, that's good enough for this code. You probably already know that um, under the Medicare wellness visit, screening for cognitive impairment is still a requirement. You all do the MMSE. Some people will do a more comprehensive test like the BCAT or something like that. Um, but you have to do something during that annual wellness visit. And you also can at other times get information from family members, from other physicians, from caregivers, whatever, who say, hey, I'm worried about X, Y, Z. That's part of, you've got your Medicare annual visit, and then you've got the 99483 where you can bill it separately and you should bill it separately. It's a complex, process. This is not a MMSE go home. But, and this is kind of the technical catch, okay? Sometimes it's hard to get your patient in to come in twice. So a lot of physicians will do the regular annual wellness visit. Something in that annual wellness visit makes them think that they need to do the more complex testing. They do that at the same visit within 24 hours and you just put the modifier code on. Or you can just have them come back and do a separate billing under the 99483 and be more extensive. This is one of the catches. Um, I'm quite grateful that they now use the word independent historian they used to say informant, which I always felt sounded like uh, something the FBI or KGB would be interested in. But you need to have an independent historian to validate the information so that you can correctly perform the assessments. And your care plan 
has to have information from somebody who really knows what's going on. You've all heard of show timing, which is when a person with dementia can hold it together for a short period, put on a show, act great, almost seem cognitively fine, and then it's like the lights go off, the shade goes down, and it's all over. That's why you need the independent historian. That can be an adult child, a spouse, a guardian, a neighbor, a friend, whoever really knows the patient and can provide reliable information when the patient cannot. I'm going to go into a little more detail now about what it is that you need to do as part of your real cognitive assessment, not the mini mental that's just part of the um, wellness visit. So if you are going to get paid for the 99483, you or someone on your team who is actually allowed to bill for this needs to do all of the following. One is a cognitive focused evaluation, including the pertinent patient history and examination. And one of the things that's really important to this part is you can also rule out delirium by doing this. So if it is, I've noticed over the past year that mom is declining X, Y, Z versus mom was okay on Tuesday and now she's not. You have to be very well aware of the medical decision-making ability of uh, moderate or high complexity. You have to be able to do a functional assessment, um, including decision-making capacity. There are indeed really excellent screening tools out there to use. You need to be able to do that. So you can have all of the information you need that says this person can dress but doesn't have the cognitive impairment to make good decisions or there's no way they're going to be able to do medication management, et cetera. There are a couple different standardized instruments to stage the dementia. You could do the FAST or the CDR, it's whatever you prefer. And then this is the big, big, big one. I probably should have put it in yellow with flashing lights on it. Medication reconciliation and review for high risk medications. So we all know things like the benzodiazepines or misuse of prescription medications or sometimes just regular use of prescription medications that aren't really appropriate for older adults, particularly some that may have mild cognitive impairment or more. Be sure to look for polypharmacy. Be sure to look for doctor shopping. And also make sure you know everything that person is taking. I always tell clients to bring in their bag of supplements, not only a med list, but that you need to see that they took one of everything off the shelf in a big box store. You need to be able to do a real medication reconciliation. And we know how hard this is. The other part of it is you see the prescriptions, you see the bottles, you see the med lists. We again, don't know that all of those things are getting correctly into the pill boxes and then going correctly from the pill boxes into the patient's mouth. That's part of what you need to do during the medication reconciliation is to verify that you're comfortable with the method of all of those things happening. And again, you're getting paid for it. You can bill it separately. Again and again and again, medication reconciliation. I cannot emphasize this enough. We've duplicated this. I will triplicate it triple whatever the word is for that, but I could have gone all the way through. I can't tell you how many patients were on things like um, pain meds. And then all of a sudden they looked like they had dementia. And when they went off the pain meds, they still had mild cognitive impairment, but it wasn't nearly as bad. The other thing you've really got to look for, particularly post pandemic, Evaluation for the neuropsychiatric and behavioral symptoms. You got to look at depression, anxiety, et cetera, and you've got to standardize it. <coughs> you have to really use standardized instruments 
and verify depression and anxiety. It's become much more common. It seems to exacerbate dementia symptoms. Sometimes it even mimics it. One of the hardest things you need to do is the safety evaluation. You want to know what, whether they're safe at home. Are they going to burn the house down? And here's the biggest, driving, 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 driving. If they're not cognitively able to drive, they also are probably unlikely to recognize that they are not cognitively able to drive. You need to be sure to report them to the DMV. You need to tell the family member and you need to have the family member either take away the keys, disable the car, et cetera. I don't usually tell people to take away the driver's license. It's an important form of identification, but I would make the car go away. You also have to, as part of the 99483, identify who your trusted resource is, who the caregiver is, and make sure that the caregiver is willing and able to do it. Because a lot of times your patient will say, oh yeah, my daughter will do it. And then we're back to one of the original slides of she's working. And then you have to do an advanced care plan. A care manager can help you with that. You can also outsource to a care manager, but there has to be a good plan. If you'd like to learn more about this, because I know this has just been an overview, we do have a, an ACCME accredited course at carebrains.com, and you should feel free to join us there. The course is called Improving Dementia Care and Patient Satisfaction. It's 10 CME credits. You'll see it's also certified for pharmacists, nurses, and social workers. And we find it very helpful. Our clients and doctors have found it very helpful. So we hope you'll join us for that. The reason we put this course together was that doctors needed to be able to understand the basic functions of the brain, recognize if their patient is or might become cognitively impaired, and make sure that you're planning and interacting accordingly, that the doctors can implement effective communications methods, emphasis on effective, with the patients, the family members, the care management, and this charge teams, not just the medical care, but again, you're part of a team. I would also add that you would also need to learn how to deal with and understand lawyers and financial advisors, again, so you're all on the same wavelength. One of the biggest things we go through in this course is identifying and implementing ways to reduce unnecessary hospital readmissions. It's the bounce back, right? It's the discharge without the right resources, without the right safety nets in place. We try to teach you how to do that. And then, this is a big one, how do doctors protect their own brains? So those are the objectives of the CME course. And there's a special discount for AMWA members. You should go to academy.carebrains.com slash CME. Now, not to forget your patients. Remember, we talked about how important it was that you have educated consumers working with you. We've created a caregiver certification course called Mastering the Dementia Care Journey. This is intended for patients, family caregivers, professional caregivers. It's nine courses. It's about an hour to two hours per course. It's for non-healthcare professionals who want to understand the whole process. We go through many of the same types of information that we do on the professional course. We also have a bigger emphasis on how to pay for care and how to find appropriate care. Our goal here is to make sure that the entire dementia ecosystem is on the same page so that the patients are getting the care they need, that the professionals are getting the support they need, and the family caregivers are also educated and supported. 
If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. I'm Jody Lyons, and you can find me at carebrains at clickmedics.com, or you can go right on to our carebrains.com website. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.